you, so. Okay, it looks like we're, looks like we're live. Cool, yeah. finally. Hey man. Last time was an epic fail on your part. On my part? You're wow. the IT guy. <laughs> Who knew that you were such a bully? <laughs> hey, that was my nickname in school. Oh, oh really? It was bully like, man. That's a shocker. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let me get a couple more screens going. Cause I just want to, yeah. I want to be able to start ask, you know, following this thing and um, taking questions or whatever, if we can. Oh, sure. look at that. There it is. All right. Turn the volume down so it doesn't interfere with our connection. All right. So uh, how's it going, Richard? It's going awesome, Mr. Dustoff. <laughs> Again with the the class. The I'm gonna make it stick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm good with that. I'm good with All that. Right. So you know what, Richard? Uh, let's talk about this. You know, you you make a bunch of stuff, and it's it's cool. It works great. It's arguably some of the best stuff out there. And so, how did you get started in motorcycling? Like, how did that come to be? Um. There was, when I was in junior high school, you're going to go back that far. Should I be laying on a couch right now? Oh, shit. Because <laughs> this might be a mental situation. <laughs> when I was in junior high school, they had these things before there was such an empty thing as MTV. They would come in and they would put up some production and they'd have music and video and all this stuff. And we, you'd go to this assembly and watch. The thing is, and they had some people come in and they get a little bit of feedback right now. But yeah. uh, you got go that? Ahead. Anyway, so. They had some video of Kenny Roberts and Freddie Spencer and those guys racing around with music. I'm like, man, that sure looks pretty cool. So then, you know, like we talked about this last go around, you know, I bought a motorcycle because I got in trouble in my car and built that and went racing locally and and uh, then, you know, went racing up at Willow Springs, all that kind of stuff. And then one day I decided I was going to buy some stuff that was listed in Cycle News or one of those racing magazines. I think it was called American Road Racer at the time. Okay. The magazine. Yeah, I remember that. Maybe it's eventually had it. I think it was called okay. American Road Racer. It was before uh, Road Racing World. Yeah. And I uh, it probably worked with that one. So I called this ad, and it was some about some YZF 750 parts, and I asked, you know, or maybe it was before that, but anyway. I, so this gentleman picks up the phone, and I asked him how much for this and that, and the prices were. Pretty freaking high. It turned out it was Terry Vance on some of his old through bike stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was Terry himself. So I'm like, man, that's way too much money. Uh, I can't afford that. So I went and bought a Bridgeport instead and just started making my own parts by <laughs> hand. Bridgeport. Then, yeah, then bought a CNC and bought a few CNCs and so on and so on. And uh, yeah, you know, hobby turned into business. So, I mean, I know you, you were in the military for a minute. Like, when did the military things jump in? Oh, you mean that part? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I broke my hip. <laughs> I mean, this, it was a hobby that forced it into a business. So I'm an engineer by trade. So, you know, to, get your, to become an officer, you have to have a degree and all that kind of good stuff, unless you made it some other way. Uh, but uh, eventually, you have to get your degree. And so once you, you know, you get your degree, you get a commission, you sign up for a contract and all that kind of good stuff. And then, you know, you're off doing your thing and then you break your hip and then you become jobless. <laughs> yeah. Who knew you were like one broken hip away from being a super bike genius. Yeah. I don't know about genius. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know how they say some kids are special. <laughs> to me, genius is kind of the same type of term. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, maybe nobody really knows this, but, you know, let's talk about where all your parts are made. They're made right here in Huntington Beach. All of yes. them. Everything you, everything you guys everything. Know is made right Let there. Let me think. No, the carbon bits are not made here. We, we were doing body work uh, for a bit and uh, it just too difficult to make the stuff stateside. It just make it really difficult. So the, the, uh, the carbon bits we have made by a French guy who's got a shop in Thailand. 
And that's the only place we have our carbon heel guards made, but everything else is made here. The guy does really good, good work and he's super reliable and he sends his shipments on time and all that kind of good stuff. So that's about the only thing, you know, other than that, everything's done here. Yeah. I mean, I, I told you this before, um, I, I've known you for a long time and yeah, you know, I always thought that all the shops were a small staff, independent shops like you guys, right? And I can remember being shocked when I did a tour of Yoshimura and it was like three or four buildings over there and it was a giant oh, yeah. factory oh. employing hundreds oh. of people. And I'm like, dude, I thought you guys this whole time were like four dudes like at Richard's shop. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We're, we're actually a real small business. Yoshimura is... is I mean, I guess they consider them as, you know, a small business, but they're not. They're a corporation. They're multinational. It's a big, it's a big organization. It's massive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you basically, you know, you, you put your programming or whatever, hand it to Caesar and he hits the red button basically, right? Yeah. There's more to it than that. You got to tell the machine how to start, where to start, what tools to pick up, how to, how to cut the parts, how much to cut, how fast to cut. So all that stuff comes in some program somebody wrote somewhere and it figures a lot of that stuff out for you, which makes it really nice and really easy. And uh, yeah, off you go. The, the trick is how to design the parts. You know, anyone can get an online class and how to machine a part, but designing the part takes a little bit of knowledge. So where did the, where did the attack name come from? Oh yeah, that's another... I had a friend of mine that I was in the military with his, and uh, we, were, we were doing kind of a little side business and uh, we were always into hot rods and off-road trucks and things like that. So, so we started this, this business just doing a little bit of odd end jobs and, uh, we, and we couldn't come up with a name. So we're like, you know, hey, what's, a, what's something really fast? So something fast for Latin was called the tachyon, which is they use it in Star Trek and all this stuff, but it really <laughs> means in Latin, the speedy one. So we called it, tacky on research and development. And then we're getting these phone calls from places that are going, hey, are you doing particle research? Like, no, we're not <laughs> building a building a accelerator. We're just making some cool parts. And uh, so then, uh, you know, it was so confusing to people that we just finally called it ATAC. It was supposed to be A-T-A-C-H, like a TAC. Well, that's, where you're, yeah. that's where the word tachometer comes from, actually, like tachometer, which means right. speed meter, flatten. I did not know that. Yeah, that's where the tack means speed. <laughs> Look it up. Yeah, I'm sure there's people Googling it right now. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, so yeah. to make it simple, we just call it a tack. Nice, yeah. nice. So you make and sell parts for a pretty wide range of different motorcycles, right? Oh yeah, I mean, oh. the Italian bikes, the uh, Japanese bikes. You know, uh, so even some British bikes, the Triumph, which are yeah. really made in Thailand. But uh, yeah, as you can see back here, you know, we've raced three different brands ourselves and one on all of them. And we, we like to basically design our parts around the racing projects. Like the, when we did the Triumph stuff, we were racing Triumph. So we built a bunch of stuff for the Triumph, linkages and rear sets and handlebars and all that kind of stuff. Because you get a lot of knowledge back from racing. You know, right. you have a real a real driven rider who's super talented and he can put the parts through its paces. So, you know, pretty much right away, like with Cameron, you'll know the first five minutes he rolls out if the part's good or bad, you know, because oh. he's, he's so dialed in, at least on that one motorcycle, right? You yeah. Know, I haven't yeah. seen him on another motorcycle, but I'm sure he's probably going to be about the same. You know, once the, he'll say, oh, this is bad and this is good. So it's pretty, pretty good to be able to work with riders like that. And we've worked with a lot of riders like that who are, who are pretty switched on. So they, you can try something, say, hey, we're going to try this linkage, you know, or try this swing arm or try this. You know, you do all the work you can on the computer and you do a lot of modeling, but at the end, somebody's got to ride the thing. So th that kind of goes into the whole uh, race what you sell, basically, right? Oh, that's you absolutely what you race. Right. We race everything that's on our bike. You can pretty much buy except for a couple of items like the swing arm just takes too long to make. But, uh, you know, I guess we've sold our swing arms off before. The price is right, but you know, there's there's good guys like Suter, one of our sponsors. They make a decent swing arm. That actually, the Westby guys that we sponsor also are currently racing. But you know, everything that we do, if you race an AMA and you actually wanted one of our swing arms, and you know, we're obliged to sell them for Motor America. I mean, I'm still stuck in the past. So 
you know what, let's, let's talk about your overall design philosophy, you know, cause you make so much, you, you make so many different parts for so many different bikes. Like there's an overall design philosophy that you have that kind of somewhat carries across all the stuff you make, right? Well, it's all performance-based. So design philosophy is it has to work. And then of course it has to be um, aesthetically pleasing too. It has to look cool. Yeah, it has, it, to look, it has to look cool. It has to look cool. Yeah, but we don't make everything just because it looks cool. Like we're not going to put spikes on the ends of the pegs. You'll skewer somebody. You know, there's there's guys with crash guards have spikes on them. You know, I just, that's oh, not our thing. Know. We we've seen it at the racetrack a lot. Of course, of course. You're like, you know what happens when that bike lays on you? <laughs> you die. <laughs> exactly. And racing is just not worth death. But uh, anyway, it's everything is based around basically a performance window. Even our rear sets are, are designed and we give it a certain amount of range that race, racing real racing riders will, will operate in that range. And so when a guy gets it, it's going to be something that's probably been raced on the racetrack at some point or another and developed around it. So what's the deal with, I always give you crap about it, but like, what's the deal with the attack? Hey man, isn't this a family show? You're I said crap. Oh, ex expletives out there. It's, I it's said crap. Asking, is it? So, yeah, so what, uh, you know, what's the deal with the attack gold? It's not attack gold. That's what it's I actually, it's, a, it's actually an aerospace hard finish. See, like, let me, let me grab one right here. Dun, 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 dun. See that color right there? I don't know if the light's good enough, but you kind of yeah. see it, right? Yeah. That is the actual natural color of the material when it's hard anodized. Oh. So the longer they anodize, the thicker they put the coating on, the more it changes color. And... So if you, you can tell, here we go. Here's another example. See how these are two different colors? Can you see that? Yes. These are two different materials. This is the bottom from our super bike. It's made out of one material and the top is made from another material. And it's made of a different design. Both of them are made to do a certain function, whether it's to control the tube or give the rider feedback. So the material makes the color and the material has a certain function and uh, about it. So it's basically gold. So yeah, it's gold. It's gold. <laughs> Attack gold. And olive, whatever I call it. Titanium color. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard it all. Okay. So, you know, there's there's a lot of different stuff out there rear set wise. Like I, I, I think all of your rear sets are adjustable, right? Like you don't do any yes, of that. Except when we when we were making some stuff for the factory Kawasaki team years ago, we made them fixed because they had a position they wanted them. Okay. You know, like, hey, Tommy Hayden's riding this and Roger's riding the same or, or, or Eric or whoever was their teammate at the time. So we just want them like this. No different. Okay. <laughs> them like that. And uh, the factory sewer bikes uh, last year were also fixed. Oh. You'll know some of the MotoGP, I mean, probably most all of them, they make a particular bracket yeah. for the rider and, the, and they test and test and test during the winter and then they're fixed. The problem with doing that is you end up with about four or five different brackets. And we've seen like at our level, you know, even with a guy like Cameron or Jake or Josh Hayes or whoever, right? Josh Heron, all these different riders we've worked with over the years, Chaz Davies, they all have a certain position and then they'll find that they want to modify that through the season. You know, so sometimes you might go to a racetrack where, hey, the guy's dragging his toes. Like Pridmore, for instance, he uses toe feeler all the time. You know, and he would feel the he would feel the track with his toe feel, at least when that's the way he was when he raced with us. And so we would, if you raise the pegs up, he'd go faster until he crashed. You know what I mean? Like raise them up too high, he's going to keep leaning over. Yeah, you know, I think that, I think you actually way back then in two thousand one. I, I think you actually said use the Pridmore example when we were <laughs> setting up the rear sets on you know yeah that, yeah you know. like like you like yours really high and. Right. And Josh liked his in almost standard position, but back one. So you can see where we would want to make, it wouldn't be practical for us to make five or six or seven different brackets with all the stuff that goes with it. It's, it's way easier for the consumer. It's, and it's actually easier for us as a race team to have some adjustability and it doesn't add that much weight. It's actually fairly light. I mean, it's a, it's a grill, it's a grid with a few holes, you know? So it, it, uh, it works out well for us. You know, we've been racing that way for a long time. Uh, you know, one of the things I noticed that you started incorporating in the rear set is 
like on our Yamaha stuff, you you uh, machined in the the Yamaha speed blocks into the into the rear set. You mean these things here? <laughs> yes, Richard, those things. Yeah, this is when styling kind of took over because this has absolutely no function. <laughs> styling went out on that one, but yeah, we're trying to. At some point, we're trying to maybe make the things a little more. <laughs> Yamaha, Yamaha uh, consumers are very dedicated to their to their brand. So the more brand friendly you can make a product, the more they're going to want your product. That's you know, I, how long have you been a Yamaha guy since two thousand six? I've been a Yamaha guy since 2008, actually. Yeah, so I've yep. been a Yamaha guy since I was 14. Okay, well, you know, the, the two-stroke thing that we talked about yeah, last time. Yeah, right? yeah, I just took a detour on what paid the bills and got us the racetrack a little bit. Nice. For the most part, I've, I've been a Yamaha guy. Well, yeah, I mean, you guys have been doing the Yamaha builds for customers for, for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, look at, look at like, you know, Valentino, for instance, right? And, and the, the following he has and the big Yamaha brand. I think it was, it was a tough pill for a lot of guys to swallow when he went to Honda right. or Ducati or someplace, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting a couple of questions and I'm going to save yeah. some of these for the end. So, okay. All right. um, you know, they're asking, there's a few people asking about specific models for tuning and that kind of stuff. So oh, yeah. Well, we I, can, I'm just going to yeah. add that stuff to the end. And um, yeah, there's a, oh, Gil says uh, his, the grandson couldn't believe Attack was a four-man show. Hmm. Well, it's a little more than a four-man show, but okay. It's, yeah. You got some part-timers, you got some full-timers, yeah. And then uh, Marcus Jackson says, dude, is that the GP bike in the background there? That is the GP bike in the background. It is. It it's is. a really expensive trophy. You're going to, that's your track day bike, right? One day, but it's getting so dated now. Yeah. You know, Wayne Rainey stopped by along with Chuck Axel the other time. You know, he was kind of poking at it. I go, I can't believe this thing's already 10 years old. It felt like it was, seemed like yesterday. I mean, 2011, that thing was, 2012 was circulating. It's yeah. About 10 years old. So, you know what? Back to your rear sets. You know, yeah. you, uh, speaking of the Yamaha thing, you've always had a way to figure out a better way to make certain things work so mm -hmm. like for instance on the back of the r1 rear set you had that linkage on the back of your rear set so you yeah could, that that was the older the older r1 the one right. i pushed through the frame yeah yeah and you were able to retain that mm -hmm. rod through the frame and do the reverse shifting three on your linkage instead of flipping the shift knuckle on the on the bike right yeah, yeah, we do that still on the older, older R1. Oh, do you, is that still available? Yeah, that's still available for all the, we do, we do almost every R1. We just started phasing out some of the really old ones. We're not getting that much, you know, of a draw for them anymore because they're just, they're old, they're 20 years old or whatever, right? People aren't riding them. And uh, we do it on the, on the Triumph 675. We do it actually on the Kawasaki, the new one too, because okay. of the way they designed the whole shift mechanism and it goes under the frame. It's not very easy without putting all the shift rod and all that stuff outside the frame and pushing the whole package out. So I like to keep the package tight. Yeah, you know? I've seen some of that stuff on, um, I'm just gonna say the price point rear sets. The price point. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I've seen quite a bit of that on that kind of stuff, but yeah, I mean, it just looks so cool when you walk up to it and it's all this cool linkage and yeah. like how, how much longer does it take to design something like that? Nah, a little bit longer, but you know, once you do one, the next one's easy, you know, so you basically adopt the, the whole, the whole mechanism in there and you, and you try to figure out the leverages. And, yeah, it's a little simple math. It's not a big deal. Okay. So let's go to the foot pegs. Um, All right. How come they're so sharp? You know, I mean, I, you know, how come they're, I know they have like a, there's a relief in there, I think. Yeah. And then, but I'm telling you, man, like, I'll give you a story. Um, Amy Grana from Chakwala came out to Button Willow with me yeah. a few years, several years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I remember helping her load her bike in the back of her truck at this, it was somebody else's track, I don't know. So we're there and I, I load the bike and, the, and her attack rear set caught me on the leg. And it was like, oh crap, you know? So I looked down and there was like a tuft of my leg hair on her foot peg. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I figured out. Wear pants. Like, what'd you say? 
Wear pants. Wear pants. Thanks, Richard. So tell me a little bit about why the foot pegs are shaped the way they are. Well, the, uh, the pegs, let me grab one again. So I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but the pegs have a cleat that's fairly sharp on the outside. And then they're fairly smooth on the inside. So when the guys hang off the side, they don't have to put a lot of pressure on the peg and not keep their foot from slipping off. And so it makes for a lot less effort when you're hanging off the motorcycles, just like having grip tape and all the things that people put on their bikes to stay kind of in one spot or a nice seat pad that isn't totally slippery. It's the same concept. You don't want your feet falling off the pegs. I've, I've seen some, and also too, just to back up, in wet weather conditions, which we race, uh, it's really, really good to have your feet not slip off the pegs because you have to be super smooth. And uh, the other thing too is the perforation in here, that you can kind of maybe see it, I'm not sure with the lighting here, but uh, if you do have a crash, the peg has a tendency to break off of the perforation and still keep some of it on the bracket. And therefore you can pick up the bike and maybe finish a race to get some points. You know, if you're in a, a series where you want to finish, you know, not a track day, you're like bummed out and put the thing back in your truck and leave. Well, I mean, even the club guys, you know, I mean, typically the club racers don't let you pick the bike up and finish the race, but yeah. you, know, you can pick the bike up and finish your event. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, a track day guy's there for fun, right? So if yeah. he's over, then he's kind of bummed out. Oh, man, still but, a lot of the track day guys still will desperately try to put their pile back together. You know, that's the way I was. I just didn't expect everybody else to be that way. <laughs> one time I had three crashes in one day. <laughs> wow, dude. My thumb still hurts from that. <laughs> oh, thanks for giving me the thumb dig. Yeah, oh yeah, the thumb, the one with the wire sticking out, yours. Yeah, oh yeah, mine's the same. It doesn't oh, really man. bend too good anymore. So funny. But that was, that was those, that was back in the day when they had those Michelins that would just high side you the moon. <laughs> I remember one time looking down my motorcycle as I was flying through the air going, wow, this is gonna hurt. Oh, so somebody saying that they were just there. Um, I guess they're taking off, they're messing with the wrap on the trailer. Some guy was just at the shop. Is that true? Trailer? Yeah. That had been a while ago. It must have been a while yeah, ago. Yeah, because that was done, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Before the oh. COVID thing, I thought. Maybe came in during it. I don't remember. But it okay. was it was not, it wasn't wasn't a minute ago, but you know, some people say I was just there, it could be six months right. ago. Right, just there two weeks ago or yeah, exactly. It wasn't today. Right. Okay. Oh, and then uh, Dean Vincent. You remember that dude? Oh, yeah. He used to help me out. Yeah. He's like, when are they going to let you guys go racing? Uh, I could tell you, but then I have to kill everyone on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's your answer, Dean. Apparently, nice. apparently all the teams got some kind of confidential heads up, okay. but it was confidential. Ah, and then, and then one of our guys took the ball and ran with it because we didn't read through the whole thing. But for perfectly honest with you, so we pissed off a few, few people in Motor America. Oh, okay. But I'm sure if you if you typed in Google right now, when's the next Motor America race? Then I'm sure you'd find it. Wow. Okay, so let's go back to the stuff you got going on. Okay, so on the rear set, you know, up until not super long ago, there was a uh, solid toe peg on the shift and brake side yeah. and now you know I, I can't remember exactly when you switched over to the folding one but what's the deal with that what's the purpose there well again let me see if I have another prop here props I figure you're gonna talk about products so i figure i might as well have some so basically same kind of idea when you tip over this thing it should fold back not snag and typically that's what happens we hardly ever have these things break off. It's so crash survivable. It's great. You know, you might you might lose, like I said, part of the peg, but your shifter's there. So you can get up and go. Same kind of idea. It's just a dirt bike, same kind of concept. You know, you tip over, you want to pick it up, pick it up and go. This dirt bike's get bent up, maybe the levers get bent up a little bit. Guys will kick them straight or whatever. But same type of idea, you fall over, boop, thing tips over, snaps back, pick up your bike, you know, throw a few expletives out there and tip right out right away. You know? Lots of lots of colorful expletives. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, throw, kick nice. a few rocks, bash the tank some more. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So okay. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about your lift mount thing. You know, I've I've been riding bikes with your parts on them for I don't even sixteen years maybe. Mm -hmm. 
I was writing some, oh, I, right. I was poor and broke before and I was buying cheap crap, not realizing it was a better idea to buy the good stuff first. Yeah. So a lot of new racers will probably learn that eventually. Um, you know, I have a saying, I know it's a family show or whatever, but cheap S is still S. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So um, one of the things that's been cool and you started, I think you started making something like this on, on the Kawasaki like a million years ago, um, lift mounts where, you know, you, you use um, hooks instead of spools. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was pretty cool back then because it had a shelf, you know, to you set the wheel on there and all yeah. that. And, you know, there's been some variations of that. I mean, we've had the R1 in multiple generations, the R1 for mm -hmm. since the 08. And you, you had some on the, the cro every cross plane R1, you had the lift mount mm -hmm. on. And then now, now the current one, actually, should I? Like yours, yeah. Right there. Yeah. yeah. So it has, a, it has a tow guard. Uh, on it now so well what they what they call the sprocket guard yeah yeah so tell me a little bit about what your what the deal is with the hook thing that, besides the fact that they look cool because that's why i get them because well again crash survivability so if you have a spool on your bike and you tip over generally what happens is the spool gets ripped off and then the guy comes in the pits and his body works hanging and his handlebars bent and you go to stand his bike up you got no way to stand it and then there's rocks in his tire and all this kind of stuff. And now you have some mechanics trying to get a screw that's bent out of there, or they're trying to lift the bike manually while they change the tire. And you look like, you know, the Keystone Cops, if anyone's old enough to know that. Keystone is. Cops. <laughs> yeah, you know, they all run in circles and bumping into each other. Kind of look that way anyway after a crash, but trying to make it look a little more professional. <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know who the, the Keystone Cops are, y'all Google it. Yeah, it's black and white. But that's that, that the key, if you say Keystone Cops, it goes right along with drinking the Kool Aid. There you go. Know what that means. But they'll say, why are you drinking the Kool Aid? It means you're getting, just going along with the program, right? Right. You know that Jim Jones killed a bunch of people in, in Guyana. <laughs> right. And so, one of the guys that's a customer of yours, uh, Alex Chavez, says that. He says to me that I'm still broke, just a higher level of brokenness. So that's racing. Yeah, we're all uh, broke. <laughs> I mean, for sure, absolutely. We're, you know. I mean, you know, short. life is pretty short. You might as well do what you enjoy. Exactly. And if riding exactly. on the racetrack's what you enjoy, that's what you do. If sitting at home and pushing on that remote is what you enjoy, then more power to you. Yeah. You know. You might be less in that less broke category than the more broke category. So, okay. So that's pretty much the lift mounts idea. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah. On the, well, on the new R1 too is when we looked at that. Now we generally make items for stuff we race. So when we helped Mean Motorsports in 2017 and won that Superstock Championship, you know, he came to us with the motorcycle. So we started building it. And we made the lift mounts, and then we were looking at, okay, how can we make this thing illegal? We're gonna put a sprocket guard on it. But that swing arm is so thin on the Yamaha. The Yamaha has a lot of side flex in their swing arms to make them pretty thin. And if you drill holes in that thing, you're gonna, you're gonna be asking for trouble with cracking and things like that. So we incorporated, that's why we incorporated that thing into the stand mount itself. It was someplace easy to change, it's bolted on. I mean, it takes you two minutes to put it on. You're done. No drilling, no riveting, no nothing. I apologize. I have a helicopter flying over. We live okay. in Antelope Valley. There's always some kind of aircraft flying over, breaking the sound barrier and stuff every day. Well, I mean, you know, where they, where they designed that stealth bomber was like right up the street from where you're at. Basically, yeah. Skunk yeah. works or whatever. Is yeah, like, yeah. That one building right, right off 14 there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's move over to the clip-ons. You know, you've got a bunch of different variations of clip-ons. You got, you know, standard clip-on, you got the zero offset thing. Should I get a prop? You could grab a prop if you like. I got a prop. <laughs> Here are props. These are called props. Okay. Not the kind that helicopters use. So let, what's the difference between the standard offset and the zero offset? Uh, so this is the standard offset, the one that fits basically on the front 
of the port tube, right? So it's further. So imagine if this is the front of the bike, right? And you're riding like this, your arms would be out a little further and you have a different leverage on the steering, right? And if you look at a lot of the standard motorcycles, the bars actually come in to the side of the tube like this does. Mm. So this would be the tube. So imagine that one's up here and this one's in there like so. So you kind of see the difference. Okay. So what this does is it, for some of the smaller riders, like what I'm used to working with, it puts them in a better position, gas tank to handlebar relationship. Also helps with some of the braking. And some guys don't like the handlebars turned back a bunch. It puts a lot of pressure on their wrists when they're, when they're hanging off the bike, especially if they're trying to hang off with their elbow straight. So this allows the handlebar to spin forward a bit, cleaning up some of the angle of the handlebar. Comfort is everything when it comes to road racing. Now, some taller guy might, might want this. Yeah, but we, we run this almost exclusively. Again, working with ri different riders, whether it's Heron or, or Cameron or whoever, you know, we, we, we learned that this was the handlebar for us. But this, will, this is what we generally rode for many, many, many years like this. And guys were used to it. They had the big gas tanks, the ZX7RR, you know, with a gigantic oh, gas tank, R7. Yeah, gigantic endurance tank with two dry brakes. Now the gas tanks are teeny tiny, small. They're like a 600, the whole bike's like <coughs> And so, so the positioning is more like made for a small guy. So can you hold up the clamp for that thing again? Yeah, there we go. You know, a lot of the base and clip-ons out there are the kind that you kind of slide over and tighten them up. Mm -hmm. Kind of take the chop triple clamp off, you know, and, and yours, you don't really have to do that because you have that clamp thing. Like, tell me a little bit about what goes into that. What's the... Well, it's, it's why, why, do, why is it like that? Well, it's two pieces, you know, like this. And so we make, it, it's a little more expensive, a little more time to machine a bunch of different parts like this, a pin, a clip, a, the front part, a back part, all the different operations that go into it. But this, like, once again, crash survivability, change out, all those things are really important to us. Whether it's changing an engine really quickly or changing a handlebar really quickly, you want to be able to swap out parts. Like for instance, the handlebar tube, two pinch bolts, boop, handlebar tube slides out, push it back in, put the pinch bolts, tighten the pinch bolts up, you're ready to ride. If you put all your, track. All, your yeah. all your brakes and all that stuff on here, your brake line with a dry brake, you can make this stuff super duper instant. And you, you, know, you still have to take off your stock stuff. So at some point you're going to have to pull your top clamp off to get this arrangement. But once you set up, you know, you, you have your forks off, you're going to go have a valve. It's best to have this, this style, this style uh, handlebar set up. Hmm. That's, um, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, well, I, again, like it's, it's function over form, right? I mean, function right. dictate, dictates form. So that's one of those things too. You're always, always looking for, I'm a really lazy mechanic. You know? so I don't really I want to work that hard. I would argue with that. <laughs> yeah, probably. But I really don't want to work that hard. Why make it harder on yourself than it needs to be? Okay, so, you know, another thing, you haven't actually had this one super long, the brake lever guard thing. I mean, it seemed like a lot of clubs are starting to make that mandatory. You've got to have a brake lever guard. I mean, you didn't start making that until three, four years ago, right? Yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not really one to be uh, reactionary, like, uh, but the, the rules come about because something bad happens. Like the whole, there was no belly pans on super bikes for oil <laughs> retention oh, until, yeah. Yana, until Yanagawa was killed. Oh. In somebody else's oil. And, mm. then, and then I do believe it was that year or next year that required everyone to have belly pans to okay. retain the oil in a blow up. Somebody blew up and he crashed in that oil and he, and he was, he was killing, I think it was, um, he was, um, what's his name's teammate? Who's that tall dude from Texas? Um, uh, man, I, sometimes I just blank out on the names. Must be the cholesterol pills. I don't know. <laughs> nice. Colin Edwards, it was Colin Edwards' okay. teammate. That was a long time ago. But yeah, he was, he was killed and, uh, or was it the guy? No, it wasn't the other guy. I was sorry. He was the other guy. It was Yasutomo and the guy. That guy got killed. And then the Yamaha Superbike team pulled out of the rest of the events. 
And that's oh. the way the whole belly pant thing came in. And so the whole, this guy came about from another guy getting killed in MotoGP. And it was hooking, hooking the guys, bumping into his brake and crashing. And so then they came up with, okay, everyone needs a brake protector. So that no one could come up and, and, and tag you and then push on your brake. Right. And so I see a lot of stuff out there that's, I mean, and then, and then we said, okay, well, if we're going to design something, we're going to make it to where it really works. It isn't some piece of plastic that could bend and hit your lever anyway. That's just there to satisfy the rules. Right. You know, there's a lot, a lot of stuff out there. You might as well duct tape a twig to your handlebar and call it a lever guard. I'm sure that I'm sure the tech guys that CV make could probably back you up on. Yeah, and those guys shouldn't be riding like that, you know, because it's it's really why have it at that point? Why have that rule, right? So, so we made ours out of some really good. Again, notice the color, a really good aerospace material that that is pretty indestructible. And also, one of the things I always noticed is. Everybody's got a little hook on there to protect the lever, but not too many people have the hook to where it bounces forward. So if actually somebody gets caught up in it, it'll release and it won't twist your bars. So that's that's one of the things that we designed in this thing. So again, function, you know, it has to be functional. It, it seems like that's why you make everything. <laughs> yeah, and the, the other thing I noticed too was when we were using somebody else's lever guards was whenever a guy tipped over, the whole thing would be spun and like, pointing straight up or straight down, hit his body work. And so we designed ours with a locking feature. You know, so the little sleeve actually locks in. And so once you tighten it, let me pull this guy apart. It's actually kind of difficult to pull apart because it does lock. But that little sleeve right there locks into the, the actual assembly like that. I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a little keyway there. Oh, dude. I had no idea about that at all. Yeah, so, and then you got a little tapered nut. And so that whole assembly, again, function, right? It has to function. Goes into your thing, and once you lock it, this thing will not rotate. I mean, you have to break the thing off for it to rotate. And so that keeps you from riding away with a lever guard that's spinning around and, and trying, to cause, trying to cause a little bit of chaos for you when it catches your body or if it's flailing around too you know, wow. after a crash. So that's when you guys, your tech guys should be saying, hey, black flag that guy, he's dangerous. So uh, the big thing that you make is those triple clamps. And yeah, I know you had a few generations of the triple clamps. Oh, yeah. Uh, what was in your head or what was the reasoning behind changing the design of the triple clamps that you'd previously used and worked pretty well, right? I mean, what was, the, what was your design reasoning behind changing the design? The fork guys. The what? The fork engineers. Oh. Every year they change the fork. Oh, okay. So you have to, and so the forks get a little thinner here, a little thicker there. So they start changing the way the forks flex. And so you have to accommodate that with the design change on your clamps. So as the forks became more and more modern, the tires became more and more grippy, they might have become chatter prone or they might steer a little differently and the rider starts to lose feel. You have to do a little design change to see if we can get some of that back or, you know, the speeds are co coming up as well and the lap times are going down. So the riders are asking for a little more from the product. So it, it's again, it's, it's all about the function. It's all about the evolution of the, of the product. That's all it is. It's just the evolution mm -hmm. of the product. So, so it's so like the flex into the clamp. Or well, like for instance, back. like this clamp here, this is our top clamp that we that we phased in and phased out all the old stuff that was, you know, the normal, like a, a, a V-shaped clamp. Right. This allows for, before we like get into all the details, certain amount of feel, certain amount of flex. And then this is our, this here is our latest generation superbike clamp. And what we noticed too was when you clamp some of the newer tubes, the tubes actually will it's like clamping a balloon. The tube will bend one way or another. Oh. Based on how you clamp it. And that could cause stiction in the fork tube and all kinds of things. I probably shouldn't even be giving away that little bit tidbit because- I mean, that's, I've that's, heard, that kind of goes into what, uh, I've heard some people saying that if you over torque your clamp bolts- Same kind of idea. Hard, yeah. Right? Yep, same kind of idea. The stuff is getting a little thin in certain spots. You know, that um, if, because they're trying to make the fork work under braking and under side load. So the fork has to kind of bend a little bit for the slider to go up and down through there. 
And so right. you can clamp a fork into bending it, you know, so you can over clamp a fork. So it's the same kind of thing. You could squeeze, squeeze down a few thousand. Like for instance, if you have any suspension guys out there and when you have always loosen the top clamp before you take the cap off. Right. So imagine that on the lower clamp, for instance, mm. you no, know, if you're tightening it, you can't get the, if you tighten the lower clamp, well, maybe the, the, the slider won't slide properly or the fork tweaks a little bit. There's a few thousands, you know, and, and then the fork won't work as good. So there's some of the ideas of what's behind the design aspects of the clamps. And of course, once again, racing, 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 you go to the racetrack and the guy says, Oh, I like that. Like we were on in one test, we did three different types of bottom clamps with Cameron. Oh, and really? You can feel every iteration. I think that was the one you went to. It was one yeah. of the first tests or maybe it was the second test before this COVID thing hit and then we were all stopped like throughout the anchor, you know? Yeah. I don't know if our guys even remember how to work on motorcycles. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been at the shop a few times and I've seen Walker in there. Walker hasn't forgotten. No, oh, he's wearing a spacesuit when he comes here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, sure. <laughs> bubble boy. Yeah, bubble boy. He's, he's, he's got a big old round bubble with some armholes. <laughs> Okay, so you know what? I actually had um, your bo the body work on the list, but you already kind of touched on that. Yeah, um, we X that pretty much. We still have a bunch of it, but we're, we're, we let the other guys who want to make fiberglass make fiberglass. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, somebody's asking uh, if you're going to make any suspension parts. For what? <clears throat> well, I, I think this gentleman has an R6. So. R6. You know, <clears throat> again we kind of work around the rules that are given to us and so if there's because we race we don't want to make a part that's just there for whatever reason like when we did daytona sport bike we were allowed linkages and things like that so we made a bunch of kawasaki linkages and modified the swing arms right kinds of things but lately super sport for instance it's all do not modify do not change this do not change that so other than somebody wants one that looks good for their for their street bike, it's really not worth it for us to make it, I guess. Yeah. You know? Plus the item is fairly inexpensive and there might be some other guys making stuff that may or may not work. You, you could generally work around the linkage that you have at the, at the club level or the regional level and make them work pretty good by playing around with the shock valve and all that. For sure on our bikes, it's a super bike class. So we have, you know, four different linkages, a different swing arm, a couple different swing arms, things like that. But yeah, the R6, I think it'd be, it'd be cool low stuff. on our on our list. What's that? Yeah, so you're basically doing all kinds of cool superbike stuff for the R1, but not so much yet for the R6. That kind of leads into my next question is, you know, because you guys are the Yamaha official superbike effort, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to have any kind of specific to Yamaha stuff in addition to what you already have, you know? Well, uh, for sure, for sure we have our next race kit order, the first race kit order came in and we sold out all that. But we have a new website, Yamaha, attackyamaha.com. And we will be adding all the race kit parts in addition to, like if the guy clicks on the R6, he'll have kit cams and springs and harnesses and all kinds of things specifically for his R6. Right. All there here real soon. It should be any week now they'll be getting that next order. We just didn't want to put it out there and have people trying to order it until right. the stuff arrives from Japan. I know, I know that you, some of that stuff is for me, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I but I mean, like, is attack making Yamaha specific stuff? Like the little, um, I don't know what you call it, but it's the bracket that kind of replaces where the uh, kickstand mounts, that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh yeah. We and the cool that. little thing to make the shock change easier. Yeah, we'll be we'll be doing all that as this program stays fairly Yamaha specific uh, as far as the racing goes. Uh, again, back to a little bit of history. When we were the Kawasaki effort, we made a lot of little things for the Kawasaki that weren't maybe mainstream for every motorcycle, but for sure the guys who were building Kawasaki race bikes bought it up and used it, and they were it was very specific to those motorcycles. And we will be making that if we don't already have it now. Like for instance, on the Yamaha R1, we make a, some linkage plates that make it easy to access the shock without having to pull the whole rocker off of there. 
So right. it's a, and so that, that was a big plus for us because we were able to change shock in and out real quickly. Again, yeah, so lazy. Are you going to do that for like a super stock uh, application? Well, with legal in your club, you can put it on. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, standard dimensions. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you have to check it, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check with Jay Tanner on that. Yeah. Yeah. It fits a, exactly stock dimensions. I don't know why it wouldn't be. Okay, so, um, you know, I didn't really talk about what what the triple clamps do because I know they're an adjustable offset. How yeah. does that how does that affect the bike it's handling? Okay, so probably should back up a little bit. So here's a clamp, right? There's a clamp, and you see the hole is oval, right? There. And so we have these inserts here that slip in. So the clamp like so, and then you pinch them off and you know, you have a stem which goes through here like so. Okay. And so what this does is it moves, imagine this is the front of the bike. It moves the fork back and forth in relationship to the frame. Okay. And if you're, if you're guys that are watching right now, go and Google like our YouTube uh, attack performance triple clamps. There's a YouTube video from ages ago when we were again, the monster Kawasaki team. Uh, that had a whole little depiction of how the clamp works and what it does to the trail. Okay. And what that is an adjustment to actually just the trail number and that you can make a whole hour long video on just that. <laughs> I mean, if you want to really get scientific about it, but um, there's a little bit of like a 10 minute thing that they can watch on YouTube. Like I said, if they, if they would just search YouTube. So the, the cliff notes version of that, like the-, the Yeah, so, so what you do is- Version of what it does. Yeah, so what a lot of guys mistake is that if they change the offset, like for instance, this, this is a zero, right? It's neutral. And if they go and they put in like what well, this is a five, right? So if they put in a five, they end up moving the hole. You see that? Right. right. The hole, so in relation to where the fork tubes are. So right. that moves the fork tubes back. But oh. what a lot of people mistake is, and even some of the top mechanics always get this wrong is when they move the fork tubes back, that increases the trail. A lot of people think, it, oh, it shortens the wheelbase. But if you think about it, think about it logically, a wheelbase is what, about 1,400 millimeters, right? Yeah. Sure. Approximately, you know, 1,200, 1,400 millimeters, right? And you're moving this thing only like two millimeters. What's the percentage of two and 14? It's very, very small. But if, you're, if your trail number is like 110 and you move it two millimeters, that's 2%. Oh. That's a feeling you get. So you're really affecting the trail, not the wheelbase. So when you move this thing closer to you, it actually makes the bike turn a little bit harder, but it gives you more feel. Okay. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So the initial turn in might be a little more difficult, but it'll want to keep carving a corner. And why stop at just moving it this much? Why not just make the thing straight across? And because eventually you can't even turn the motorcycle. Okay. So imagine the shopping cart type thing, right? Where the wheel trails, the axle in the front and the things like wagging around back there. So that's the point that you're uh, taking in and out is that distance there. And uh, so, yeah, that's basically, it gives you a little bit of adjustment. And the other thing that we do for the R1 as well, which works along with that is these things they call rate cups, right? So you put one in the top, you see how they're offset like this? Can you see yeah. That? yeah. So they're offset, you know, once, so one goes one way on the bottom and the other one goes another way on the top and that changes the angle of the stem like this. So it rakes out or rakes in the the angle of the steering head and that's legal for superbike and i think super stock's also legal maybe not in, at the club or regional levels but uh anyway so that rakes out the bike and that that changes that's a big change okay these are these are, these are fine tuning and these things are massive changes so if you want to re-engineer how much and a hammer here, got it <laughs> yeah this is the hammer and these are the scalpel most people need a scalpel but every now and then a bike needs a hammer so generally on the R1, this is a big deal. Okay. Yeah, it gives you, a, the R1 already comes with some offset clamps that are like 25 stock. So this allows you to run somewhere in another range about 27 to 25 by changing the rake. So it's kind of like the, the big adjustment. Okay. And these are, the, these are the small adjustments, yeah. So a guy on YouTube, uh, Yamaha dude. Wants Yamaha to know, dude. Yeah, that's his name, Yamaha dude. I might know that guy. <laughs> yeah, me too, right? Yeah, you know uh, lots of people. He dudes. wants to know if you're gonna if you plan on making a fairing bracket for the 
R1? No, it's not really our cup of tea. There's so many moto holders and all those other guys out there making them. I mean, obviously we make our own for our sewer bikes, but that's about it. You know, that's a whole nother business in itself. Okay, well, there you yeah. go. Our, our four guys working their butts off in the back and just don't have enough time. I mean, you can hire one more just for that, right, Richard? Just for fairing brackets. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, that's my fairing bracket dude back there. Yeah, hey, remember, we're in Huntington Beach. Every right. employee's a mint. <laughs> right, right. I should move to Texas. We've been talking about that, right? Then you'd have to live in Texas. You know, when they close the beaches off, I'm like, what's the difference between here and Texas now? I can't go to the beach. (laughs) We're like five minutes from the beach, we can't go. Oh, so you know what? Uh, Rob Escalante is asking, um, when you design a part, uh, where where and how do you conduct your tests? Yeah, at the racetrack. I mean, we... we, Uh Let's say, well, hold on, let's back up. First, you can test it on the computer because computers are powerful enough now to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Right. Like you can figure out the aerodynamics of the whole motorcycle if you wanted to before you go to a wind tunnel. Same with, you know, aeronautical stuff. They're designing that stuff. And then and then they go, okay, well, it works in the computer and we did all our math and everything's cool. We put all our forces and all the loads and all this thing didn't break. Now we got to go and do some real world testing, so. That's when you got to get a stupid rider, super fast, and go right around. You know, it's called empirical data, collecting empirical data. Empirical data. Yes. Got it. That means it worked and that didn't work. Oops and yay. (laughs) So, um, and then uh, Dean Vincent wants to follow up with your triple clamp thing. He's like, so no more solids. Tell tell Dean to figure out how to put on a steering damper first. (laughs) That's an inside joke. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh man, let's see. Uh, so, what was his question? He he wanted to know. Uh, he he said so with the triple clamp thing. So no more sawzawing the steering head. Yeah, no. <laughs> Why is he giving away our secrets? <laughs> Didn't he have a confidentiality agreement at some point? <laughs> oh man. Yeah, uh, we used to before there was such a thing as these rake cups and doing all this kind of stuff. Like an R, R7, for instance, comes with adjustable rake. Same with the Ducatis. So that's been something that's been around for a while. Yeah, we used to actually cut the steering head or you put it in the chassis. Uh, there's a there's somebody asking, um, Henry Yip wants to know, uh, when was your last track day? I know it wasn't the one I threw you out of. <laughs> no, it was after that. It was a Chuck Walla. I think yeah. it was that. I think it was that number 15 rap bike over there that we won Daytona with. Our yep. former street bike. I went out and uh, when did Yosef start working here? Six, seven years ago? Uh, eight years ago, probably. Yeah, that was. I, I went with him a few times when we took our semi up there. And yeah, I think we had, had to be 2013 or 14, I think. No, because we did Eric Bostrom on that Suzuki in 2010. Right. So it had to be right around that that time when we were doing the the that area because then we've got into uh 2011 we did the kawasaki superbike 11 12 so it had to be right around that time like around the eric boss from time so the wild 11 or 12 maybe yeah it doesn't matter it's all the same yeah. i forget i know i, I i'll I be mean, equally slow when i go out there again you know what that's bs because i've seen you ride you know i had to throw you out remember <laughs> <laughs> You know what's yeah, funny so, is, is is riding those Formula Extreme 600s are so much fun. It's like a little superbike that I remember going to, when you threw me out of that that thing at, at at Willow Springs. You know I was passing that leader bikes down the straightaway with that thing because the gearbox is so short and you come out all wound up and just a right. fun motorcycle ride. Well, you know that I'm just gonna follow that up. You know I we we have the rules at the track day and. They yeah. apply to everybody, including oh, yeah. our buddy that owns the big shop and race team and all that, right? Yeah, four guys. Yeah. yeah. And four, yeah, the four <laughs> guy. Yeah. So uh what that was was Richard had uh Richard was out on the racetrack and um had an issue, maybe ran out of gas. No, it was my 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 boot, the little toe slider thing. I think one of your buddies got me this cheap Chinese boot. Because oh, something is- happened with my boots, I can't remember. <laughs> remember that? Remember that? No, I don't remember that. 
yeah, you got me some boots from somewhere because I really needed some boots just to get to the track day or something like that. I couldn't get mine in time or what, I can't remember what the deal was. My size is weird, you know? So one of those little toe things felt, uh, started coming unwound from the toe when it was dragging on the, on the peg and I thought something was falling off. So I, I stopped and pulled over at the end of the straightaway there to have yeah. a look down. I'm like, ah, crap. And there was like this fence. I didn't want to go around again because the thing's like hanging off my toe. So there's this fence, like it was maybe a meter or two back behind me. So I kind of turned around for about a meter or two, went back out the fence, and then he came over and threw me out. <laughs> something, I'm going to say something along those lines, but you know, the, yeah, it definitely wasn't counter, gas. You had to go counter course to get to that. It was in the pit lane. <laughs> Something like I mean, that, yes. Like I said, it's a million. Hey, I mi but I missed the rider. About I missed, it. But I missed what? the rider meeting, so you can't help fault me for oh, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Stephen Bradley has been pretty adamant about wanting to know how you got involved with Yamaha. I, I, I think we touched on that on our last. Yeah, one, last go around. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they. They, they were obviously looking for someone to take over the, uh, the superbike team. If that's what he's talking about, he's talking about current, I imagine, because right. I've had some involvement with Yamaha off and on over the last few decades. But right. um, yeah, so we were racing with Heron and, and they, they basically threw a couple of motorcycles at us and a couple of engines and we went out and did our own dime and we almost finished second in the championship and we raced for second all the way till the end, you know, even having a, a few bad outings where we broke the bike in half. You know, and uh, right. but anyway, nonetheless, um, you know, Yamaha saw the kind of effort we're doing, and and we're literally five or ten minutes away from them. I think ten minutes, and so I think it was just a, a good fit for them to have a team take over that is capable. You know, we've been, yeah, you, know, you know, our first three years with Suzuki, we won two championships. You know, we won Daytona a few times for, with Kawasaki and raced at front over there. I don't know if we won any championships with Kawasaki. I don't think we did. That was a tough motorcycle. Very fast engines, really tough chassis to work on. You have to make work, you know. Right. Like the new, the like the the new Kawasaki you see in World Superbike is nothing like what they have for a street bike. You know that thing has completely been redesigned. But really good engines, really crappy chassis. Can I say crappy? I did. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so for me, the Yamaha thing was like a yeah, the Yamaha thing was a natural fit. You know, I I didn't push it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't over there begging them for a job or anything like that. It's, it's, they, they found an outlet they could, they could hopefully trust and they were doing such a great job. I really didn't want them, didn't want them to see them go away, you know, and hopefully they're not away, you know, maybe we can right. expand this somehow, but you know, it's, it's, it's just the times they, they had, they wanted to uh, switch their focus a little bit. So, so it was really easy for them to uh, kind of just knock on our door a little bit. Right on, man. Okay, so let's talk about the thing that everybody was emailing me and private messaging me about. Okay. Let's talk about the fancy swing arm. You know, you kind of showed it a little bit on our last one. Yeah. Let's uh, put it up there again, because that thing is cool. I didn't bring it up for a prop. Liar. <laughs> Here it is. I know you have it up there. All right, so this is the latest iteration that we're waiting. I mean, we went to Barber and just sat and waited and waited and waited. We really wanted to try this thing. And we didn't have a chance to. And but I mean, I can't take all the credit for it. Some of the design work is um, influenced by what Yamaha Europe's got on their swing okay. arm. But if you can see how the shape is here, it's yeah. really thin on one side. And this is this is the this is the business side, the chain side, and this is the feel side. Okay. This is kind of the philosophy Yamaha uses. I think a lot of motor GP bikes are the same way. And you can control the can you hear that? Yeah. Because this thing is completely CNC machined, you see that? Out of a big giant chunk of billet. And Suter makes their <laughs> swing arms. And same thing over here. And these are also okay. CNC machined. Even the shock tunnel, you can kind of see it's all, I don't know if you can see that real well. Oh man. There, yeah. And uh, anyway, so this whole thing is 100% CNC machined with the exception of a few little thin pieces of sheet metal. And we were trying to test this because we can control, tell that dog to shut up. <laughs> Richard says it's all the dogs to shut up. <laughs> Jimmy. Yeah, anyway. So, so, yeah, so by controlling the thickness 
in the thickness of this, you can control the flex and the feel of the swing arm. And that's the most important thing. Also too, is Yamaha Europe has one type of linkage design. The Yamaha US had some other linkage design that have two separate holes. So to make testing a little bit easier, we allowed for two different positions in here. Can you kind of see it? So yeah, yeah. We're, anxious, we're anxious to give this guy a try. You know, so in a couple, of weeks, a couple of weeks, we'll be out of, uh, at Buttmolo, uh, give it a try, do some laps. So that's like the third generation of the swing arm? Yes, yes. That's the third one for the R1, yeah. So what, I mean, besides looking cool, because it's yeah. awesome, yeah. Um, you've had a few on the other, the last couple of years, you've made your own swing arm, and you've had a couple of generations of it. Like, what's, what's the difference between them? Is it just the... I don't know. Is it stiffness? Is it uh, that? That the way the linkage works, the length, the uh, mainly, yeah, the torsional rigidity. You know, so so it's mainly this. I actually call it the stiffness when it's on its on the side of its on the side of the tire. You know how it's the amount of feel you get and the amount of grip you get on the edge. Okay. I think that's one of the things that uh, was always uh, more elusive you know, the elusive thing is getting the grip on the edge of the tire. Hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, so uh, we got a chance to test one of the Yamaha Europe arms. And and at first it was like, wow, this thing really isn't that good. And then we were like, well, well you can't just throw something on and say it's no good. Right. You know, that was the first impression, like, wow, I, I don't really like it. Let's put on your arm again. That's like Cameron's work, right? And then uh, we're like, well, let, let's work through the, let's go through the process and work it all out. So we different shock settings, different spring, different this and that. All of a sudden, wow, I really like this thing. This is really great. You know, so we actually learned a lot from just the, those guys loaning us a single swing arm. Because okay. that gave us one more point of testing, that empirical stuff, right? Instead of yeah. us going out, you know, I mean, we kind of knew where we wanted to go, but it kind of helped it speed up a little bit, I guess, the development, because we were able to look at something that's that's already been proven. I mean, you got Vandermark and those guys, Lowe's and those guys out there riding on the thing in there kicking ass well you know one of, one of the things i noticed about it because i've had your bike in the back of my truck and it's yeah. super long i mean your uh your rear wheel the rear wheel was out on my tailgate and i was like dude how is this thing so long so what's the deal why is your bike so freaking long well i mean all the modern bikes have electronics right mm -hmm. one of the standard packages is anti-wheelie okay and so why are drag bikes so long? Okay. They don't want them to wheelie. Simple as that. And then you could, uh, but it's, it's, you can't just make a bike long and expect to have grip. You got to work on the balance. And that's why you end up with these rake cups to change the balance between the front and rear tires and the length of the swing arm. And you could, you could actually apply more power to the motorcycle and get around the racetrack better if you're able to make the grip work with a long motorcycle. A lot of guys can't make the grip work. You know, just imagine leaning forward on the gas tank and dumping the clutch. You're going to do a burnout, right? Same kind of thing. If you if you unload the rear tire, you're going to lose some grip. Okay. So the trick is, how can you make the bike long and still turn, not wheelie, and not lose grip? So that's a balancing act. That's where you get into all these different little swing arm pivot positions and linkages and shock rates and you know spring rates and shock damping and all these little factors that go into making one of these get around the racetrack. And once you find kind of a little window, you can start experimenting a little bit outside the window. And it's kind of hard for a club guy to get all that. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's actually pretty easy because all you do is just put your bike at the end of the slots. Okay. You know, and see, it doesn't mean it works for every motorcycle. Like okay. on 600, you probably don't want to do that because you want to keep the bike nimble, doesn't have a power to wheelie, really. Right. If you're up in the high desert or something, not gonna wheelie. You know, you want to keep the, all the grip, you want to keep it turning, all that kind of good stuff. Well, you, you can wheelie anything, skateboard. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're going fast. <laughs> hey man, it's all about looking cool, right? Yeah, well, that's one aspect of it, yeah. Man. It's all about having fun. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you got to enjoy what you're doing. Okay, so a uh, former employee of yours. Uh-oh. Did uh, I fire him? Harry, I don't know, did you fire Harry? I no, know. I, didn't, I didn't fire Harry. <laughs> Yeah, he wants, Harry wants to know like how many hours of machining time went into that swing arm. 
I try wow, to keep track dude, of it. Step back and take a breath. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Okay. But this way, the way this thing is built, it's more machining than assembly. It took about two hours to assemble it. Okay. And it took probably about over two days to machine it. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, looks like and the whole thing. The whole thing goes together like Legos. Legos. It's, it's basically the whole thing's machine. I mean, it presses together and, and welds down a V groove. And I mean, you hardly even need a fixture for it. It's so good. Well, that probably goes into the your computer drawing first, right? Yeah, absolutely. You got you to gotta take a little bit of heads up on what you're going to do and what the end result's going to be. I mean, you can make a, you know, a piece of sheet metal that's 600 millimeters long and go, yeah, it's a swing arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, you don't do anything like that there. No. Okay, so um, I got a couple more questions from people. They're saying that um, what's become easier or harder to accomplish with technology today? Hmm. Electronics have been easier, much easier. We talked about yeah. that last time, right? I mean, yeah, I even though this, even you guys though, building all those motors. Yeah, the the uh, engines are the same. I mean, what's gotten harder? Building harnesses. You know, because they're the harnesses are fairly intricate. If you want to do them right, that's probably the one of the most time-consuming things. You could build a bunch of engines before you build a single harness. Right. So the engines are fine. You know, swing arms. I just like making them. You know, it's just a hobby more than anything. So uh, other than that, I mean, we're sponsored by Suter. You know, if I was, if we didn't have the capability, I'd probably just get one of his. Right. You know, so um, I just like making the things. Or we could buy one of the ones from Europe. You know, but it doesn't make sense to us when we could do all the stuff in house and we could save a few bucks also. But um, so, so that part's a little time consuming. I think anything to do with fabrication is harder now, like the special gas tanks, the, the, um, and anything that's really labor intensive, which is, I think, the wiring harnesses. But the, the actual functioning of electronics has become very, very easy because yeah. it's, so, it's so normal now. Like every motorcycle comes with it. Yeah, I mean it's crazy. So, even yeah, even OEM, yeah, you know, yeah, off the showroom floor, they're pretty damn good, you know. You have yeah, to keep I mean, them a little bit. The new R1's got the engine braking stuff now too. It's crazy. yeah. I mean, you could switch stuff on the fly. I mean, of course, when you have a stock motorcycle, the engineers have uh, the lawyers have something to do with the engineering. Right. You know, they step in and say, "Well, that's a street motorcycle, so you can't have the guys changing stuff on the fly. You can't have a change in sectors." You can't have it have it do all these things that you would want to do on the racetrack, you know. But for us, I mean, with sector mapping, you tell it how long the track is, and you break up the track, and you can tell it, on this corner I want this much power, and that corner I want that much power. You know, a lot of times you don't use it because the tracks have very similar, I guess, acceleration. A lot of tracks do, like yeah. corner to corner, and uh, so you you only have maybe a couple of different combinations throughout the whole racetrack, so it's not that difficult. You know, but uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff is, is plug and play these days. You know, there's a lot of good stuff out there. that's really, really easy to do. So um, another thing, uh, the same guy, John, uh, Johnny Simrosko, got to give him props for asking these questions, but uh, okay. asked if you're using rapid prototyping, you know, or, ha or has 3D printers, uh, if you started to use that stuff yet? Uh, yes, we actually have a new 3D printer coming. Okay. But the problem with 3D printing is it takes a long, it's not that rapid thing huh. is kind of not rapid. Okay. Because, because we can make an aluminum part way faster than the same thing in a, in a plastic part. Right. And way more durable. You know, okay. so it depends on what you're making that. And if you're making something, I'll throw some words out there like peak, you know, which is a material for rapid prototyping or, or printing, you know, 3D printing. Yeah. You know, um, it, you can make some stuff that's functional, but most of most of the 3D printing stuff is are for toys, you know. So there, you have to figure out what what about rapid prototyping actually makes sense. So some shapes you can't do on a machine, like you know this. You don't have, you can't have square end mills. Although I've seen some stuff cut round things, cut square holes, pretty amazing. But uh, there's no such thing as a square end mill. So if you want something with really sharp edges, this and that, 
you may want to go down the rapid prototyping, the unwrapped prototyping. Like here's here's a for instance, the chain guide for a swing arm takes about 13 to 19 hours to print. Eesh. That's not very rapid. Eesh. Yeah, a nylon part molded takes you probably a few seconds. <laughs> you know. So it's it's not so rapid. But yeah, there's a place for it. But uh, the other thing too is you have to have a proper printer that can print at super high temperatures and 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 and, and do things properly. Okay. So um, then there's another guy he's asking about. <clears throat> His name's Kevin, and he wants to know if you collaborate with other engineers or teams, i.e. World Superbike, to aid in your bike tech and fabrication, and does it still cost a lot of money for you to develop a bike, or do you save a lot of money by doing all the work yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> On all of it. There is a little bit of collaboration with the electronics guys because they have the back end uh, when we were uh, running on what they call the sat level electronics, satellite team electronics, the back end was locked. So whenever we hit a stumbling block, we had to have them go into the back end and add a feature or adjust a feature. Uh, like for instance, it might have the power reduction locked for a certain, for wheel control. And say, hey man, can you, uh, can you give us a little more power reduction? Our bike still wants to flip over backwards. And uh, so then they would go in and do it, but that took a little time. So eventually they built some trust with us and they started opening up more and more and more features on the back end. So there is some collaboration with electronics guys, with the engine guys, not so much. Okay. Uh, I guess if maybe we're a little proud, I don't know. We kind of want to do all this stuff ourselves. Right. You know, so I, you get guys who don't mind asking the whole world how to do something. We're not that way. Okay. So if they want to say, hey, you're now one of us and you have to build it this way, then we will. But Yamaha hasn't really been that way. They're like, hey, this is your team. Do do what you want. Just don't mess up. You know? <laughs> don't mess it up. Nice. Don't mess it up. You know, that's, that's about it. You know, so that's kind of the approach we take. We, we, we kind of do the things that work for us. And if there's some, we run into a stumbling block, we may ask some questions, but we're not getting a bunch of, I mean, we did get a swing arm test and that was, that was, that was great. We learned some stuff there. And at one point we wanted to buy a number of those to save us some time, but we decided just to build our own. And we might still buy their swing arms, who knows? You know, depends on how ours go. But, uh, you know, the, the object is to win, but it isn't always just to get a free, free lunch. You know, this, is, this requires work, it's a race team. Right. Okay, so Chad Williams, AKA Owen Williams' is dad. Uh, oh, Owen Williams. Owen Williams is that, that little dude on the 400. Anyway, he's like 12. Anyway, his dad asks. We need more guys that are like 12 coming up racing. We so do. Job, man, Chad. We do. You know, so, so Chad wants to know, uh, do you design all the parts in-house? What's your approach to design? AutoCAD, do you use SolidWorks, Fusion 360? You know, does it go, does it go from thought to finished product all under one roof? Yes. And, and, and um, how do they find their designer programmer slash, you know, I think you design everything, right? It's all right <laughs> here, baby. <laughs> I do it all. I do all the design work in the shop. Okay. Remember, we're a four man operation. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I do the job of four people. <laughs> well, you're also a truck driver too, right? Is I do that... have a CDL. I don't want to be a truck driver. No. But if it means, but if it means well, we have three truck drivers on the team. Okay. We have Lee, who was who was drove a Yamaha truck last year, who was on our team, and then we have Walker, and then we have myself. We all have CDLs, and okay. it's always good to have to have that ability, just in case somebody gets sick, somebody gets the COVID, who the hell knows, you know, and you can still go to the racetrack. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, as far as his questions on design work, yes, we use the latest, greatest software that we can get. Let's just leave it at that. And okay. we do all the finite element analysis and we do the design work and we do all the test fit, fitment, testing at the racetrack, all done here. We don't collaborate with very many people. Okay. Uh, Steve Bradley wants to know if you hold any advanced degrees in engineering or anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I'm, I got a bachelor's because I, I wanted to be an officer in the military and that's about it. Okay. And everything else is, is, you know, you get your degree and then you don't use it because you're whatever, carrying a rucksack and then you go back to it. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I did do some internship at NASA and a few other things, but I'm not here about my resume. Yeah, I'm not here about my resume. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the shop. Okay, so you know, you you make all that great parts, but you also have the tuning center as well. So you know, you got a tuning service. You can build engines. You know electronic suspension all that stuff right so who has access to that i mean are you just doing that for pro teams or are you, you doing it for gen pub how you yeah know? mostly i mean for local guys it'd be guys like you but guys come in from northern california they come in from the vegas area you know about probably a good thousand mile radius the guys will bring their bikes over and we've done stuff for international people you know there was right. some guys and local champions in in dubai that kind of thing yeah yeah mexico too right mexico the local champions down there you know a couple of brothers down there i think escobedos i think was one of the guys and a few other guys down there and so yeah so we we built for just about anybody that wants to build we don't specialize in any particular motorcycle although we we do a lot of our ones a lot of yeah. like we tune we have a dyno that runs almost every single day like two or three times the bikes are up there oh man yeah, I mean it's hard. It's hard to go clean that dining room, get all the all the soot and you know exhaust smoke and all stuff off it because it needs to be repainted. We run that thing. We run that thing to death. Yeah, you know it's kind of funny. I was going to bring this up because yeah. you got a new dyno a few years ago. Yeah, and um, your it's a heartbreaker. Old, yeah, the heartbreaker dyno, right? Yeah, no, the, it's old a heartbreaker. Dino, the old dyno. Um, Mark Bodecker is a friend of mine, and he, yeah. he used to say that your dyno ran downhill. <laughs> With the wind? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think what happened was, I mean, our very first, our, our first dyno was delivered by Mark Dobig, the original owner of DynaJet. Oh, really? Along with, along with Tom Hausworth, who was Ben Spies' crew chief when he went to World Superbike and MotoGP. And uh, so that was so many years ago, but I think they screwed up on the drum mass or something like that. It was mm -hmm. always a little bit optimistic. You know, and, we, and finally, when we updated it with a brake retarder and a few other things, because back then, yeah, I think you had to put your, get a leather glove to slow the drum down, you know, like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, hold on the rear brake. <laughs> but uh, as the, as the dyno progressed, you know, um, they finally end up calibrating it properly. And then it was, it was good. Yeah. I mean, I can remember my, I now it's below good. My, my 2015 R1 on the old downhill dyno made over 190 horsepower. <laughs> That's like 175. And then, and then it ran 180 on, yeah. on the new dyno. Yeah, we figured it was about 3% or so high at yeah. some point. Yeah. And then, and then the, the dynos have gotten a lot better too because those things used to have, you know, the, the, way they, the way the SAE numbers work is there's three factors, which is humidity, pressure, and temperature. And Sometimes one of the sensors would be bad, and then the then the um, then the correction factor would be skyrocket or down under water, you know. Right. And so sometimes you didn't know what dyno you had that day, so you could <laughs> have a good day or a bad day. But now they're way more repeatable. The sensor yeah. packs are way better. Heartbreaker now. I mean, it's yeah. Like, I mean, it's hard. It's a heart. It's a consistent. And then it's like, eh, eh. it's a consistent heartbreaker. Right. Yeah, which is yeah. good because if you build a an engine in the winter. You want to have, and you build a new configuration in the summer. You want to make sure you're talking apples to apples. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, Richard, you know what, man? We've been talking almost an hour and a half. But That's it. Are you kidding me? It's an hour. Are you serious? Hour almost, and a half. Is it? Yeah, like hour and twenty-five minutes. Wow, <laughs> dude, you shut the, uh, people are asleep already. Dude, I can't believe. Yeah, thank you everybody for watching this thing and uh, giving us some questions. I got a couple more. Um, Let's see. Uh, they're saying that they got their R1 pimped out at attack. Me too. Cool. Um, um, you, you can back me up on this. My stuff, when I'm racing, my stuff pretty much lives at the shop, right? Oh, yeah. yeah you drop it you off after. Bring it up before. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, uh, oh, so the next, Marcus Jackson's asking about this, but I'll talk about this really quick. So our next yeah. one, 
in this three part series that we're doing is we're going to talk about the writers and have fun with that. Right. I have, I have your writer list that you've had from, from start to go, you know, from start Every, to start now. That's not counting club guys. That's just national guys. So no, no. Just, yeah. The, the attack yeah. team writers. Yeah. yeah the not, national guys, because there's club guys like that aren't on the list. Right. I actually, I actually helped Dean Vincent, that guy that keeps popping up. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. He, he, he was very fast. And, he was very fast. And, uh, and yeah, he's not on the list because he was, uh, maybe he is on the list. I don't know. Is his name on the list? Because he wasn't a full-time national guy. I'll have to, I'll have to look at the list. Yeah. He might, might be on there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he always w rode a Yamaha and, yeah. you know, he rode this like hybrid thing, right? So it was like a yeah. fit, uh, YZF 750 chassis with an FZR 1000 motor in it or something. Dude, I don't remember. We built so many of those things. Right. I think so. Yeah, like his bikes were always fast. Like he'd be always yeah. running. Up I know he had an FCR thousand at one point. Yeah, and then yeah. he had a YZF seven hundred and fifty. Yeah, so um, we're gonna wrap this one up, but the yeah. next one will be about the rider. So I'm okay, sure cool. that we're gonna have fun with that, and um, they maybe talk smack a little bit. Sure. Throw a couple of people under the bus. Always. <laughs> You get truth here. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. It's not real. It's not politically correct here at all. No, but it's my version of truth. So you gotta take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, it's like the story, right? I mean yeah. it's my story. Yeah, it's my it's it's my head, and my eyeball, so it's my vision. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, Richard. Well let's all wrap right, man. up and I'll I'll talk to you next time. Sounds good. Talk all to right. you later. Later. Bye.